Hey. Hi, Antoine. You know what I realized, Bjorn, is that usually what? at that stage, there's a bit of shitty music. So I have to put that shitty music. People will think I have a good taste. So, hey, here's the shitty music. How are you? Hello, hello shitty music. Hello, Antoine. How are you? It sounds a little bit, you sound a little bit weird. Something, well, something happened with you, with your voice or? First, I sound better because I have oh, really? that microphone, <laughs> which I'm sure for all of you doesn't change anything. But to me, True. is really a big difference. And I have a crooner voice, which you also call the the mm. cold voice. So mm. I have a cold. <laughs> okay, okay, but it's just your voice, right? So we will not realize. So you're still in the same mood as usually. So, so that everybody knows, just before we went live, Bjorn said you're going to be bad, like always. So that's what happens. That's what I get as a support when I'm. I'm just. Uh, ah, come on, come on, come on. You're always blaming me, right? You're always blaming me. Now, good to have you here, everybody. I'm really excited for, for our show. We have a special guest. Let's that's, that's make the show even more interesting. Um, but I'll leave it to Antoine to start the show, if you're ready, if you are able. I think we're ready. So let's go let's for go. the opener. And that, then we can discuss what we are actually discussing today. So here we yes, go with please. the opener. So to introduce you to today's topic, I'm going to tell you a bit of my personal story. So I think we've discussed with Bjorn already on that microphone how both of us are engineers. And um, my first job in this water industry was as an engineer, and I was happily being an engineer. And one day, someone told me, you know, um, the sales guy in charge of that project um, is not available. So you should be going there and you should have a sales call and a sales visit. And that customer was not like your small customer, which is your guy in the backyard. It was the city of Brussels. So <laughs> I had two days of preparation and they sent me to the city of Brussels. I tell you, you, you book a plane, you book a hotel and you visit the city of Brussels. It was like, God, I'm not a sales guy. I have no clue how to sell. So what do you do in those cases? When you're an engineer, there's something you know how to do it. You know how to learn. So what did I do? I bought two books, which I still have. They are French, sorry. But one is Sales for Dummies that you could recognize, even if you don't speak French. <laughs> and the other is Elite Sales Guys. So I wrote those two books. That took a lot of time and I barely slept for two days. On top of that, my CEO at the time had given me the audio version of, of that book, The Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy. And that book, I mean, that conference, that audio version features 17 different ways to make a close. So how to close a sales. So I prepared my full presentation and I went to the city of Brussels, having prepared everything that was inside that book and prepared with my best closing things. Like just think, you know, you, you stand up and you make like you're leaving and they tell you they're not ready to sell. And you say, oh, by the way, and you sit back down and they should sign. Or you say, hey, do you want it in, in, in green or do you want it in red? And then they tell you they want it in red and they buy. And guess what? In that single sales call, I did not sell the wastewater treatment plant of the city of Brussels, which to that date, I still don't understand because I was so prepared. Of course, I was bad and bad to a level which is not even possible to describe. And since then, I've read numerous books some of them written by the same author, the one saying that what he wrote in that one was wrong and that we should now go about that one. It's some marketing. of them are much better. I mean, spin selling is my personal favorite, I have to say. Uh, there's also these seven stories, uh, every sales guy. I, I have a full list of books here. I'm not showing you all the books, but one thing's for sure is that I never learned sales, which Bjorn said again in preparing that, that it just shows that I'm a terrible sales guy. And my point is, are we even trained to be sales at some point as engineers? Is it possible for an engineer to be a sales guy? Does the sales engineer exist? And all of that, after that long introduction, is our topic for today. Bjorn, the floor is what yours. Is it, what, what is the topic? Say again. Sales engineers, they don't fit together. You have the sales guys, you have the engineers. So bringing them together and saying sales engineers is a nonsense and sales engineers don't exist. 
That's true. That's true. But be before jumping into that topic, thanks for the introduction, Antoine. I'm pretty sure that you didn't ask the closing question to the municipality of Brussels, and that's why you lost the project. But anyway, before we jump into that topic, let's talk about our partner today. And um, the, the point is, do you remember, Antoine, do you remember our last show? Because our last show was about the fact that we said in 10 years from now, we don't need any engineers anymore. Okay, we agreed in the end that we will need engineers, but with different skills. And that's exactly in the line Transcend is saying that the computer will beat the design engineer in our water industry because they developed, and that's pretty interesting, they developed a design generator software which allows the user to create a high-quality plant design at a push on a button for $99 and eight hours. Crazy, isn't it? So that reminds me a little bit about a story from my end because I was, you know, I was asking myself the question, how can we solve that? And I personally talked to some design engineers uh, years ago exactly about this question because basically the municipal installations are pretty much all the same in terms of design. And we learned that from our university, how to do that, right? So and I was thinking, how can we automate that? And so I talked to these, to these persons, and in the end, I always got the same answer. It can't be done. So it turned out that I was talking to the wrong per persons because Transcend already solved that. Because meanwhile, more than 8,000 designs were created with this software for 88 countries. Sounds too good to be true? Well, among the companies which are using this software is Zeus, Black and Reach, DuPont, and many, many others. And the, the point is, if you are a design engineer you're, and you're working for one of the companies, you should be very careful in the development of your company because that's exactly what Antoine and I'm talking all the time about. So, Transcend, thanks again for being our partner today. Back to Antoine. So that makes for a smooth transition because Transcend is supporting this sales phase and this proposal phase, which is often one of the duties of the sales engineer. But what we were discussing, Bjorn, when we were preparing for our show for today is what are actually those duties of a sales engineer? So what are typically the things we expect from those, I call them Mugli, I think you had a different definition of that, <laughs> but that was in-betweens, which are not really sales, not really engineers, but which should be the combination of both. So what did you find as common traits between... Yeah, let's, let's say what, what I did, I was, I was looking for some job description. I was looking for, I went to Stepstone, I was looking for a job, not for me personally, but I looked for a sales engineer job and I... I, I found Salem, I found Ecolab, I found Evoqua, and it was pretty interesting. And the question I really have is, are we asking the right question in terms of if we are looking for a sales engineer, right? What did you find? Because, because give me another minute, because we're always looking for some kind of technical skills, but all the kind of sales skills, because a sales engineer, all the sales skills, are never asked. So for instance, pretty interesting. I found that, for instance, Salen is saying one of your one of the requirements is for being a sales engineer that you are able to negotiate tenders and contract terms. So I'm not sure, Antoine, how 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 often you have really, you know, <laughs> negotiated contract terms. Um, because this is not so easy, right? Especially if you go in detail, you have all these small things where you are, have to be very precise. In the end, what I've realized, I was never trained in terms of, you know, uh, contract terms and in terms of negotiating negotiate a tender. So, but it can make, you know, if something goes wrong, <laughs> if something goes wrong, you are, we are much, much in trouble. But this is one of the requirements. And the question I have, are we asking the right question if we are going to ask a sales engineer to join our company? So have you ever, have you ever, you know, negotiated you're done with your tunnel, I can answer. Um, <laughs> no, so that's something where we disagreed, uh, Bjorn and me, when preparing for that show, because Bjorn is absolutely, absolutely categoric 
this negotiation skill shouldn't be part of what we expect from a sales engineer. On the other end, I can tell you that I've been in that position. I've been sometimes winning projects, not the majority of the time, but sometimes I've been winning projects. So I'd be really happy to, if you had a different experience, just tell it in the chat and we'd be happy to take you. But my point here is, it is true that <laughs> those contracts are only made for the case something bad happens. So most of the time, things hopefully go the right way and you never know if what you negotiated was right or wrong. And it's always that game of you're trying to put your terms of sales and the purchaser is telling you, no, I'm putting my terms of purchase. Then you're saying, okay, no problem, but the appendix one of the contract is my offer. And in your offer, you've put your terms of sales. So you're like, you, you think that's a very clever trick, but then they put before the appendix one, they put an appendix zero, which is their terms of, yeah. of purchase. <laughs> and all of that is always a game. And it's right that we are not lawyers. But then the full question is inside the water industry is, do we want to involve lawyers in every single contract? Chances are that the answer is no. Right? No, we don't have. But, but let's at least how, how much often you was you was trained in terms of contracts, in terms of these very specific things. I'm I'm all, I'm always I'm, well, let's say I'm just saying we should be very careful what we write in in terms of how we look for a sales engineer. Even more, let's say I, I have also checked. I said that I have Ecolab and Iwokwa. Ecolab uh, was just about as all others, it's just, there's a pattern, right? They were just looking for someone who was studying chemi chemistry, renewable energies, process technologies, environmental engineering, some, something like this. I never saw, for instance, someone asking, hey, I want to have a sales engineer and this guy needs to have, or needs to be having a master in, I don't know, in, in commercial things, a master we're in always, what? We're always is, looking. We're always looking for someone who has an engineering background. Why not the other way around? Because that's the point, Bjorn. Where do you learn to make sales? Where do you learn to be a sales engineer? I don't know. Actually, I didn't, never worked in France, but I studied in France. I can tell you how it mm. is in France. Mm. In France, you have engineering school and you have business schools. In engineering school, you learn how to become an engineer. In business school, you learn how to become a trader, how to become an expert from working for McKinsey or for Bain, uh, how to become a finance guy. But you never learn how to become a sales guy. There is no like big school which would be teaching you sales. So how can you expect that as but the background for people if there's no school to become a sales okay. guy? Uh, but isn't, but isn't, uh, if we agree on that, if we agree on that, shouldn't that be at least, um, let's say, on the top priority of each and every water company? company if the sales engineer is such a crucial role that we train them not only in technical things also in commercial things how many commercial trainings you have really attended from your companies i have to say that okay, uh, to okay. that extent it must be the exception but um when i joined gf piping systems my second second day actually was a sales training and uh, we were the second day come the on second really? day it was a coincidence because they had the training planned anyways and I happened to be joining, so they took me on the training as well. But, uh, but to that extent, I was trained to, to sales. Um, but it, it is true that on the other hand, before working for GF, I've been working for Suez and on, at Suez, the best I got was that uh, advice to listen to that audio conference and uh, the audio conference was awesome to look myself in the mirror, you know, very American and say, I'm worth it. I can do it and I will sell it. And honestly, there is a portion of efficacy into that because a good self-esteem when you're trying to sell something is like a good self-esteem when you're trying to, 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 to find uh, your beloved ones. I mean, it, it helps, um, but it's not everything. But you, you're right. Training is, is something which is important to that extent. All right. I just, in the meanwhile, I fixed some LinkedIn issues. You already, you know, figured out how not to, pre not to, you know, to broadcast our show. They were not broadcast on, on my channel. They are broadcasting on your channel. I don't know why, Antoine. How, did you, did you pay LinkedIn so that they kicked me out? Because everybody's waiting in my channel, you know, to start, but nothing happened. But your channel is working. What have you done? I have done nothing aside from maybe the obvious, which is um, I'm I'm the one winning. So maybe LinkedIn is saying, why do I 
keep broadcasting on the losers channel i, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> anyway i i told everybody in my chat hey they have to switch to yours which i would never allow but anyway in this case i did um okay but let's back to the topic i think we agreed we agreed that we have to be very specific and i, I got the point antoine that you got a sales training in your second day but we all i think are pretty clear that normally sales training is pretty solemn That's pretty sad, and for such a crucial role, no, I, I agree with you. Should, see, see, we should, we should be with very, you. very it's careful it's because we, we train them all in technical things about our product, how it works, installation, blah, 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 blah. But we don't do the same effort in terms of the sales part from the sales engineer position, right? Couldn't tell it okay. better. Okay, so there's for barriers on, on it's good companies from my perspective. I mean, where that? do you get good trainings in good companies? So, but just to underline what you were saying, Bjorn, it is true. It's not in every yeah, 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 yeah. Let, Let's spark that for a second. Let's, um, if you ask me, what is the number one skill you should get as a sales guy and something which is hard to train, but something that you should repeat to your sales guy repeatedly, it is ask questions. You should ask, ask the closing questions. question, especially because the one, the one you missed in Brussels. No, 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 no. I'm saying <laughs> ask questions. And you know, as an engineer, it's counterintuitive because as an engineer, yeah. you're supposed to have all the Answers. truth and to come and to say, hey, I know your project. I know the technical aspects of it. But asking questions and raising questions is probably the first thing you shall do. Okay, good, good point. Let's say there are a couple of cliches about sales and engineers, sales engineers, and we would like to highlight a couple of them. And later on, we want to discuss one of the cliches with our guest today. But the first cliche we have is a good technology don't need any sales and marketing at all. Come on, that's this obvious. Is one, this is one of the cliches, which is not only in our industry, but pretty much in our industry because we are very technology focused. This is so hard to overcome. And that the people, some people still believe that. Can you, I mean, can you believe that, Antoine? I absolutely can believe it because, um, again, I can share you a story. Um, <laughs> on that project I lost, happened to me <laughs> some, sometimes. So I had lost and we were outside the building um, so I was the sales guy on the project mm. and mm. I was with my application expert, so an engineer, and uh, he was looking at me with a desperate eye, you know, like we lost, we knew we lost. And he was like, but we had the best solution. How could they not realize that we had the best solution? And to him, I mean, it was with all his hurt and all his, his, his soul. It was like, it's so unfair. We had the best solution. <laughs> Technically, we were the best. And I had to tell him that probably... It's even worse for me because if we mm. really had the best technical mm. solution and I was the sales guy on that project, that means I screwed up badly. But you mm. have to be a sales guy. Even the best solution doesn't work on its own legs mm. and, 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 and goes out and, and wins the, the, which is usually the point where you talk to me about Mercedes. Well, be before that, before I talk to me about Mercedes, is that Google defined this moment where the decision is two-third made the zero moment of truth so that means they they um, identified that the decision maker has taken the decision by two-third before even talking to someone about the product from the company and whoever two-third of the process to get the decision is already made so that means someone who is saying we don't need all that stuff hey look at the zero moment of truth and then exactly it happened what happened to you because you already have the best technology but nobody realized so that means also mercedes and there it comes we all know that mercedes is one of the best cars in the world um even antoine and one of and i think episode three agreed on that um they spent Never. you did it is recorded they spent 100 millions last year for marketing only in Germany, 100 millions. They are number one. Why are they doing this? If they are, if they have the best solution, if they have the best, you know, product, why they do that? Because they want to stay on top. It's the same with Apple. We all know, or let's say, I don't know any person who would ever say Windows is better than Apple. Why is Apple on this position? Because they even they spent 120 Euro, million euros last year in Germany for marketing, right? Think about the numbers. They are on the top position, but they still invest 
for their marketing to stay there, to stay on this position. And that, that is the same for our companies. If you don't invest, nobody will realize that you have the best technology and the best solution, right? Okay, so let's agree on this first cliche, that the cliche is wrong. Let me tell Isabel that I've pinned her comments because I strongly disagree with it. So uh, that is the teaser, and we will discuss it towards the end of, of, of that show. Um, and in the meantime, if we agree that the tech doesn't sell itself, and if we take the examples we have shared, which are marketing, 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 it brings me to my second cliche. The cliche is, come on. Marketing and sales, that's the same bullshit. Is it? I would say it is sometimes. <laughs> Let's imagine I'm in the, uh, you know, um, the wolf of, of Wall Street. Sell me yeah. the pen. Yeah, sell me so the pen, yeah. If I'm selling you the pen, what's the difference between marketing and sales? I mean, I could market you the pen and all of that, but it is, it is a one-stop shopping. You do one call, one sales call, and at the end of it, Hopefully, you buy the pen if I'm not too bad True. at selling you the True. pen. So to that extent, sales and marketing is the same thing. In the water industry, did you ever see a one-stop shopping? Did you ever see you enter that and at the end of the day, you've sold the wastewater treatment plant of the city of Brussels? Well, I didn't, but maybe you did. But the marketing makes sure that you are part, that you, that you get an invite to be part of the discussion, that you can you know, bring your quote to the client. That is marketing. Marketing brings the lead. Marketing has to qualify the lead, which is pretty important. And there's always the, clear, the, the clinch between sales and marketing because sales are saying, well, I got the leads, but the leads are all rubbish. And marketing is saying, hey, I got you all the leads. So, But someone has to qualify them. And the big, big, big issue or the bridge we have to overcome, especially in our industry, is that we have, in principle, marketing people who have no clue about the technology, who have no clue how it works. So they are not able to qualify the lead. And that's why we have these, these, this issue. So yes, there is definitely, there's definitely a separation between marketing and sales because marketing is, you know, is responsible to bring the technology on the table to the client. And sales is responsible to close the deal, to ask the right question and to deliver the right solution that the company in the end get the shack for the product. That is the separation. But if you have a marketing department who is, is not able to qualify the lead, then everything goes down, right? And it doesn't make sense to so get 100 of, leads, 100 of leads if they are not worse. Talking of, of marketing and sales, uh, apparently, Joseph, has a good idea to market your sales guy. So instead of selling and being quite open and saying I'm a sales engineer or, I'm, I'm, or a business developer, you could say I'm a process or project engineer and doing exactly the same. And honestly, if you're looking at, at LinkedIn, um, how many people do have in their job description, I'm a sales guy? Yeah. No one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a solution provider. Um, I'm uh, the guru of this. Uh, I'm the guy who does that. And yeah, it's a false nose. But at the end of the day, if a false nose helps you, I'm I'm happy with that. It's just... It's just about what are you at the bottom of yourself. I mean, sales is not supposed to be like, um, like the, the worst of all things. <sighs> oh, look at that guy. He's a sales guy. No, no, no. Sales is you're putting one company in contact with another company and one company has a challenge or a problem and your company has a solution. And that is what a sales guy is doing. A sales guy is bringing solutions. So maybe that can have the name of process or product engineer, but that is marketing of the sales purpose. So that's why I took that one right now because it, it sounded to me to fit quite quite nicely into, into the discussion. Yeah. Um, I mean, that brings exactly the next cliche and the next cliche is saying... No, 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 no. Before going to the next okay. cliche, I need to, to catch your brain because, you know, you mentioned how it would be marketing that the guy who wrote solution selling later explained yeah. that solution selling was wrong and you should be going to what great salespeople do, which are two different yeah. sales approaches. In terms of marketing of concepts and which helps to sell some books, there's every second year a new concept. And we had the concept of marketing, which is sales and marketing. Look what <laughs> I did. Um, there's, there was the concept of, you know, uh, everything which is linked to growth. So growth marketing, growth hacking, which at the end of the day yeah. is like marketing on steroids, which is going into sales quite fast to iterate. What do you think about all of that? You're the professional um, in that room, so I have yeah, to ask. I mean, I... I mean, the, the, the point is what, 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 what the human brain likes is to get a name or to get a tech on that. 
And that's what happened, right? They just name it. If you have a technology which is the same as all the others, but you have to name them differently to differentiate yourself, that everybody knows exactly how the process, even if it is a standard process, but if you name them different, right? We, we, we keep it in our mind. And that's the most important thing in terms of marketing. Because if you have the issue or let's say the problem on your table and you need a solution, you, we have to make sure that you are in the head of this client. And if you name your solution, your technology, and if you rename it and so on and so on, this helps the process instead of having, let's say, just a ner generic name. If you, if you say, I give you a, a, a strategy, strategy session for, I don't know, for B2B marketing, or you name it in a fancy way. The fancy way is what the people are looking for, you know, to get it in the in the brain, to keep it, and that they say, okay, I want to get that because that sounds different to the others. And that's why, you know, all the names come up, even if they are the same principles, even if they are the same, you know, the same content. Okay. That's this is answer. how this is but this is how we how we look for to to separate all the things we have to name it we have to, to put a tag on it uh, because then it is easier for us for our brain to digest then i stop my sidetrack and let's come to the next cliche and the next cliche is actually also a story which i can tell oh, um, yeah. it's sales don't understand any technology <laughs> and far it's true I right fully true farshad if you're looking at that uh, i dedicate that one to you because uh, farshad kevini was my i would say my first sales mentor the guy who tried to, to teach me a bit of sales. And I thought in return, I'm going to do him a favor and I'm going to teach him a bit of engineering and technology. And as soon as I started, he told me, stop. The second where I understand what I'm selling, I'm not able to sell it anymore. So please don't explain that to me. So that is what my first sales mentor told me. So it must be true. So I think sales really don't understand any technology and apparently it's not a problem, right? It is good that the sales don't understand the technology of the company as good as the basic engineer, the commissioning engineer, or whoever. That is a good thing because they also have to concentrate on the commercial aspect. So if they would have the same knowledge, then there, was, there would be nothing left that they also can concentrate on the commercial thing. So I, yeah, the cliche is already there. But it is good that the cliche is here and it is good that the sales is not as good in the technology as all the other engineers, right? But think, think, think about that. We have to have a clear, you know, separation between all these engineering departments, right? Otherwise, it, it would make no sense to separate them. You don't have to have the same skills as the application engineer, as the basic engineer, whoever, because you have to have some other but skills as well. But, I'm just, but, but. I'm just pushing you for the but because there's a but in your sentence. No, there's no but. I, I like it that a sales engineer does not need to have the same understanding of the yeah, but technology. That's not the, cliche. the cliche is that they don't understand any technology. So here what you're saying is that they okay. should not have the same level of understanding okay, as the application but, engineer, but nevertheless, they're supposed to know a couple of things about what they're selling. Well, sometimes it is true. <laughs> But mostly, at least, they have a little understanding. And the good thing is, let's say, what, what I've realized over the last years is if you take a, a real engineer with you <laughs> to the client's meeting, then it works perfectly. We have also, in, in terms of sales, we have also, meanwhile, a new trend, which is the set a closer. I don't know. Have you ever heard about the set a closer principle? No. That means, for instance, uh, it's, it's pretty much pretty much uh, settled in B2C and B2B is more more coming. So if you download, for instance, uh, a white paper, right? So you give your email, you give your uh, telephone number, someone will give you a call. That is a setter because the setter will qualify you. Are you qualified to, you know, to buy the product? So this is just a short call to qualify the lead. And after the setter is done and you are qualified, you get a call from someone else, which is the closer. And the closer has only one job. Guess what? To close, close the deal. I guess. Close the deal, right? So they, they separated that because every of these person has his own strengths. Yeah. And that's why they're separated. That in the industry, but, but yeah. No, no, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm almost saying that, for instance, if you go as a team to a client, 
and you are saying, hey, I'm the sales engineer and I'm the application engineer and we are working together on this project in front of you, Mr. Client, then it works smoothly. Mario, I took your comment. Um, it's a totally different show, so I think we, sh we should do that as well. But there's this strong cliche as well that sales sell something and then the guys who have to execute have to execute <laughs> something else. And then maybe <laughs> there would so be something true. to do with, uh, at this interface. And, you know, that's a bit what, what Bjorn was saying with marketing, that marketing provides the lead to the sales guy and the sales guy say the lead I bought. And it's exactly the same with execution. Execution says that what sales has sold is, is just stupid and uh, wasn't sold for the right price and is, sell, is sold with negative margin. But those guys are so good that they are able to deliver it at a positive margin. And guess what? They are measured on the positive margin. So I'm being really aggressive on that. If you want, we have to dedicate one specific uh, show on that specific topic. But yeah. It's it's yeah it's I I heard it a couple of times but that brings us also I mean we always talk about the sales but also there's a there's there's a cliche about the engineers if you take the engineer with to a client meeting he will fuck up the meeting that's yeah, one of the cliches always so the sales is, don't want to have the real engineers with because they're saying hey it goes wrong yeah they are living in a cave we all know that so if you if they go out and they are meeting customers they have no clue how to speak with a customer so they are like uh, they, they 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 tell silly things they tell to the customer everything which doesn't work with your solution and you're like shut up shut up shut up but i think you're in all honesty you've yeah. seen that i'm sure yeah. you've been yeah. to customer meetings with an engineer and you thought oh god what have i done yeah, I, I have seen both. I have seen both. I, I mean, most of my meetings where I had some other engineers with, they went pretty well. And in the beginning, I mean, the, the, the what you have to do is in the beginning, you have to make clear in your team who is doing what, who's responsible for what. So if someone is really focusing on, let's say, on the commercial aspects, then let him do the commercial aspect. And if someone else is, you know, should take over the engineering aspect, then let him run, right? And most of the cases, it works pretty well sometimes it can go wrong, but even then you can learn a lot of things because what I laughed is that I was watching, watching, you know, the client at this time. And the other guy was totally screwing up the, the meeting. And I mean, I couldn't do, couldn't do much. So I was just listening, watching, watching the client. So um, what I laugh is to see body language and body language. If someone, you know, giving a presentation, then you know exactly when he stops listening. And that's pretty, pretty important that you can use this information for your own presentation because 90% of all the company presentation are totally boring for the client. And you only realize that if you Is watch the a client, yeah, I, it's my personal set, yeah. If you watch a client listening to a, um, you know, a, a presentation from someone else, if you do this, you will learn so much. So if you have an engineer with you, Right, and he screws up the meeting. Don't concentrate on him. Concentrate on the client and start to learn. Okay, so that was now the negative side of the story: how engineers could fuck up meetings. And I think yeah. this has happened. It's not just um, a cliche, but there is a but. Um, that's something I really love about spin selling. But even more of another book, which I don't have as a book form because it's on my Kindle, <laughs> which is the Challenger Sale. And what they do, and that's also what I wanted to have with the comment from Isabel. So let me pin back the comment from Isabel. Um, what they are showing is that the best sales guy, in terms of statistics, is not the one who builds relationship. The huh. guy who builds relationship is, statistically speaking, even the worst of all types, meaning he can be good, but is less good than the other types. And the absolute best type, according to this statistics, challenger. is the challenger. And the challenger is someone who enters the room and the customer says, I need that. And he says, wait. You, don't you are that. the customer. You are allowed to have problems, but you're not allowed to come with solutions. That is my job. I cannot figure out your, your problems. I cannot mm -hmm. invent them. So I have to tell you and raise questions to just assess your problem. But I will come with a solution and I'm going to challenge everything you think. And I think that approach is something which is really catered for engineers. Because if you have no technical knowledge, then you have no way to connect the challenges with actual solutions. So sure. I think we come with an advantage in that field but we have to still practice that skill and, and, mm -hmm. and understand how to raise questions, how to come with the right diagnosis, and like, like a doctor would do. You have to, to be uh, Dr. House and enter and, and look for, for the diagnosis. That's what we don't, have to don't, do. Don't be, don't be Dr. House. Don't be Dr. House. 
Why? Because you have, yeah, you can be a bit <laughs> you, more. You, you, you screw up the meetings. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, we always talked about the cliches. The cliches are a little bit negative for the sales. And my personal feeling, well, it's not a feeling, but another cliche is that a salesperson in Europe has some negative touch. If you tell someone, hey, I'm a salesperson, they're all thinking, all right, he wants to sell me something. So he's just talking, talking, talking. So while the cliche is in the U.S., there's a green land. And if you are sales in the U.S., you are good. You are good. You're not garbage as in Europe. You are really a god in the if you are a sales person. So the question is, is that really right? And I mean, Antoine is French, I'm German. So even if, if we are very blunt and but we can't really, you know, answer the question. And that's why we have one guest today. We have one guest, one special guest, which is Adam Tank. He is the CCO, Chief Customer Officer from Transcend. And hey, Adam, first of all, good to have you with us. Is that true? Are we garbage here in, the, in Europe and you are God? And let me double down on that question because there's an additional cliche. In Europe, we have a cap on what we can be earning as a sales guy. You in the US, you don't have any cap. So Adam, you are obviously winning something like earning like 1.5 <laughs> million a year, right? <laughs> How do <you> with that? <laughs> So thank you guys for having me on. This is one of my favorite topics in the water industry by far. And I wish I was a part of this entire discussion, although I worry <laughs> that it would go on for a day or longer because the topic is just, it's, it's fantastic. What I'll tell you about US versus European sales is that the US sales mindset from what I've experienced is that it is a profession. Being a salesperson is a professional career, just as being an engineer You'd have to go get a PE. Many salespeople in the United States are trained professionally as salespeople. It is a true career. And yes, you're right. Most of the time, the incentive structure from a sales perspective, they're oftentimes the most highly paid person in the company, but that's often because they are viewed as the only revenue generating function in a business. Without sales, oh, without true. cash coming in, there is no business. It's dead. So yes, I would say in the U.S., salespeople are put on a pedestal for that reason. But when you're saying that they're, they're trained, how are they trained? Because, you know, all of these books, most of them have been written by people who were involved at some point with a big company. And um, I think most, um, it can be printer companies sometimes. It can be <laughs> most advanced uh, type of sales companies. But all those methodologies were, were built, I mean, on the job by big corporates, which had to develop their own training methodologies. Is that still the case today? Or do you have like something which I didn't see, at least in Europe, like uh, a really university where you would, you would go to to learn sales? Yes, there are now professional sales majors that you can obtain in university where all you study for four years of school is how to sell. So you learn how to ask the closing question. Antoine was missing in Brussels. You, <laughs> you learn, you learn the difference between a farmer, a hunter, a closer. You learn consultative sales versus non-consultative. You learn tech sales versus equipment sales versus software enabled sales. You learn contracts, you learn CRM implementation. You learn everything that it means to be a salesperson. So that's, uh, so the cliche is true. We are garbage in Europe because we don't have that. <laughs> we don't have that. I think it's a I don't know about garbage. That. I think w w what's important in that cliche is really this aspect of, you know, um, don't tell my, mo my my mother that I'm a sales guy. She really thinks um, I'm a gangster or something like that, which would be better in her eyes than being a sales guy. And there's also this <laughs> saying that um, we all know what is the oldest uh, job there is in the world. And uh, some say it's just a form of sales. So, you know, but th those elements are, are still very present nowadays, uh, at least in Europe, from, from my perspective. And, and th there's a reason why nobody puts, I'm a sales engineer uh, or I'm a sales guy or I'm an area sales manager on their LinkedIn. If you were so proud of what you would be doing, why would you be inventing another title? I mean, I, st I, I still think that sales is a dirty word in some cases in the, in the US because most people, when they think of sales, They think about the car salesman. And in the U.S., yeah. they always get a bad rap because they don't listen to people. 
they're just trying to push the push the car they don't care they just want to sign the contract and get out but in yeah. in our industry professional sales it, it's different you're not just trying to push a product just to push it you're actually trying to solve a customer's problem and so there is a, an air of professionalism that comes with being a professional salesperson selling big dollar contracts it's not an easy task and so if you know that mindset that is shifting in the U.S. I don't think all the way there, but I think it is shifting as people appreciate just how difficult sales is yeah. as a career. Which brings us to something which is, uh, let's say, a side cliche about the U.S., that the U.S. is very specialized, that you would have different profiles dealing with HR and, 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 and headhunting, different people working with the first sales of a sales, the, the first step of the sales, the middle of the sale, the contract and all of that. And that is a bit, and sorry, that's going to be a bit of an overlay here, but what Isabel is asking here, in, if you're not in a big corp, um, then chances are that you have to play different roles. And where does the sales start and where does the sales stop? And you, can you really be an expert of everything down that line from A to Z? Mm -hmm. Chances are that the answer is obvious. It's no. No, I'm. 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 I mean, what what I have what I have learned right now from Adam is that U.S. companies they taking more care about to train the sales, even if they have the education in terms of sales. I believe that I strongly believe that they train their sales in a different way as we do here in Europe, right? So that means you have some programs. You don't train them in terms of how the technology works. You don't train them in, you know, in operation and things like this. You also train them in terms of, okay, sales works. Here are the latest news. So we have to ask these five questions, and then probably we'll get the deal done. I mean, I'll tell you, to Isabel's comment, that coming from a startup right now, real, real world, right? 35 employees, tiny company, very early stage. We aren't experts in everything. There's no doubt. We don't have a single person that is only a, a farmer or a hunter or a closer or someone who is a pure play expert on Google ads in marketing. We just don't. So yes, we have to play multiple roles. Yes, I do think we're diluted across some of those functions. But at the same time, because we're such a tight team, we know what each one is doing. And I think that actually helps in some cases because what happens inside of big orgs is that people get disconnected. They don't know who has touched the customer, what yeah. part, what parts of the organization that they've spoken to, who, what the message is that's being sold to those different people. So in a startup, I think you sort of make up for that lack of clarity or de definition by being part of a closer knit team and communicating more frequently about that particular deal. I would have... You mentioned, Adam, how your experience with your current company is. We share something in our path is that we were both of them, in our, both, both you and me in our previous company, we were almost in the same company. And I think we've left that company almost at the same time. And what I've heard from this merger of um, Suez and De Grémont and WTS and G Water is that one had this sales acumen, like sales is on top of everything else. And the other had the technical acumen, like technical is on top of everything else. And it led to, to clashes, like cultural clashes between the two, which had to merge into the Suez WTS. My point is not to discuss about Suez WTS. It's just to me an example of, still, we discussed sales so far, but if we really connect it to the water industry, I think that is especially present in our sector to have this clash of cultures between a very technical word where it's hard to get people to pay for it because, you know, water is a common good and all of that. So there's also this thing of water and money doesn't fit that well together. Is it something that you experience also on the other side of the Atlantic and even on the other, other side of the Rhine, in your case, Bjorn? All the time. There is a, there is a, a tension in the air or in the room between your salesperson and the engineering team that's doing the design or proposal work for that engineer or for that customer that is very difficult to manage. You know, in, in practice, that looks like salesperson is speaking to a client. Client tells them their issue, says they need the salesperson's product. That product needs some engineering work in order to put together a proposal. So the salesperson goes to their engineering team. 
the engineering team takes, depending on how bogged down they are in other work, takes days or weeks to get to the, get them the designs or proposals that they need to then take to the client. They take to client. Hopefully it's not too late. If it's not too late, client says, this looks good, but you know, something changed in our end. Can you just redo this proposal for me really quick? And mm -hmm. right, we'll be able to make a deal. The salesperson takes it back to the engineer. The engineer says, oh my God, why didn't you have the data right in the first place? Or we don't have all the data that we need. I'm gonna have to completely redo this. I, I, I thought this was done. And so there was all this, it's, it's incredibly difficult to manage. Incredibly difficult to manage. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, 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 I mean, I think this story you can find everywhere even here in, in good old europe <laughs> no doubts but i think i think we have we have one cliche left but Antoine, just before going to that okay, last, go, go, last go. cliche which is our bonus cliche somehow yeah i wanted to connect that to the comment from franz josef because to me and i've heard that a lot of time from many different sales guys it's always my customer complains we are too expensive i never met a customer uh, who said uh, i was too cheap And I never said I never met a sales guy who said he didn't know a customer who said we are too expensive. The only single time in my career where I went to my sales director and complained about that, he told me something which just convinced me that you should never come back with that same thing. He told me, the day that your customers think that you're not too expensive, I don't need you anymore and you're fired. That's your duty as a sales guy to just tell them yeah. you're delivering value. And that yeah. value has a price tag. But that is a difficult conversation when you're trained as an engineer. Because when you're trained as an engineer, it's like two plus two makes four. And it's hard to come and to say, yeah, but there's also the hidden three, which is we have been developing this and that. And there's also the hidden four, which is you really have a problem and I really have a solution. So let's find an agreement. And there's a risk and there's a lot of different stuff. But this element of going to the cheapest, most of the time, if you have a price discussion with your customer, You miss something in the sales process. Yeah, and I will, I will, I will say something about that in a later stage. Let's let's go let's go first to to close our cliche round here. Is the final bonus cliche is social selling is for lazy people and for <laughs> renegades. So I mean, what we do here is we do social media. Right, I think we all three agree on that. We all here somewhere on LinkedIn, even if my channel is somehow crashed today, and you guys in front of your computer, you are also on social media, either on YouTube, on Facebook, or on LinkedIn. Is so, it really the truth that, let's say, just, I mean, let's say the cliche is really that just someone goes to social media, if he's very active, he's just looking for a new job. I heard this multiple times, even nowadays. We are three. How can this? How can this really be? How we are three really in that live. Bjorn, you're the lazy. We know that. <laughs> so Adam, you have to decide: Are you the renegade, or am I the renegade? Because I, I thought that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, be the lazy renegade. How about that? <laughs> But what, 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 what I, what I can I'm tell you guys, what I can tell you guys is, and I'm pretty sure that all of you too. We have all our, you know, our background and our stories we can share. But I, I mean, I remember one project I had was a 1.1 million project. It was a process water treatment plan. And I got connected by the client through LinkedIn because of our activities we had on this channel. So due to this, he came up and said, maybe this person, this company is the right company. And he contacted Art, us. And the conversation started via LinkedIn. For sure, we didn't close the deal for one million with LinkedIn, but the start was already there. In the end, yes, we won. So, and the start was really LinkedIn. It was it was so amazing and so impressive to realize that. And I could could give so many other stories about the, how that really works. It is not only for these two stereotypes. Okay, I know someone who wrote an excellent white paper or book on uh, employee advocacy. So I'm <laughs> not going to give a name, but um, he's saying a lot of bullshit most of the time. But right now, that one is pretty cool. So you should maybe read it. And uh, if I recall right, I mean, we have to admit there is an ambiguity. Uh, we all know that uh, if you are publishing on social media, yes, you're pushing your messages and yes, you're helping the company. But let's not lie. You're also helping yourself. You're a also putting yourself in a position where you can get offers, you can be approached and all of that. And then it, um, it's this metaphor, which I think you have in your, in your book, Bjorn, because I was referring to you, which is 
um, this, I don't know if Steve Jobs ever said that, but people attribute it to him of uh, what if we train people and they leave? And he answers, what if we train people and they stay? So it's a bit that thing. You are allowing your, your people to be visible on social media and to do social selling. Yes, there is a risk that they, that they leave, but how much of an asset are they? There's a risk anyway. Company, There's a risk anyway. Yeah. No matter whether they are on, on social media or not, there is a risk, right? But how easy is it, and I'm pretty sure Adam will agree, how easy is it to have a call or a meeting with a client and you already met on social media or he you know, is using your newsletter or reading your newsletter or whatever you post. So the discussion, the conversation is so much easier for both ends, right? That's very true. It's definitely true. And the thing, you know, something we mentioned earlier was what's the difference between the sales, the marketers and the engineers. And when it comes to social selling and imagine you're an engineer who's just built a the latest and greatest wastewater treatment equipment in your garage. And it truly works. It's truly going to change the world. If no one yeah. hears about it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's not going to yeah. make you money just sitting in your garage. Somehow people have to hear about it and somehow people have to learn to trust. And that repeated exposure through social media and the fact that you can be seen as a thought leader or uh, a trusted consultant or partner to people online makes is a, is a massive benefit for very little effort in many cases but most people i have realized they are just scared not due to the fact that they are visible they are scared to the extent what others in the company would think and say about what this person is doing so and that, is, that is we have to overcome this i mean yes they do this to build maybe their personal brand but it helps the company to grow Adam, I'm pretty sure whatever you do on social media helps transcend, right? Sure, sure, yeah, it does. So. Uh, I would say, you know, it is much more difficult, though, when you're part of a, a bigger company. So maybe this is a question for Antoine. How you can, if you're part of a bigger <laughs> water company who has stringent policies on social media, what you can and cannot say, the use of branding, logos, coloring, etc. How you navigate those waters, because oftentimes your hand does get slapped and you don't want to get in trouble from someone in HR or marketing or communications for posting a picture online. Absolutely. You're, you're fully right. And um, there, there is inevitably at some point some frictions. I mean, you're doing social selling means that you're publishing stuff on your own. And on the other end, you're in a big corporation which has 40 marketing professionals and, uh, and those people have different rules, different things which apply to them. I've seen some of, some of my colleagues which have been sharing, you know, they were dancing next to uh, to some, mm -hmm. some pipings and it was really funny and it was on TikTok and it was really cool. But on the other hand, if you're the mother company, you can never take that and reshare and say, hey, that is UGC, so user generating content and I can use it in my marketing because mm -hmm. one of your sales guys dancing next to a coupler is not exactly your your, your brand tone. So, so, so there is a discrepancy. But on the other hand, what's, what's bad can it make the company if you have one of your guys who makes a thousand of you on TikTok? Nothing. So what, what, is, what is the client or let's say the visitor on social media interested in? They are interested in the people. Whatever the content from the company is about, let's people say I have people. I, Exactly. That's one thing. But the other thing also is, let's say, if I, I made hundreds of different posts for many, many people and for different companies. And the post which works always well is where you place people in the position that they are visible. Because the customer, the stakeholder, whoever, he wants to know who is this person. They are interested in the person. They are more interested in the person as in the technology. Person first. And then the technology comes. It's permission marketing. I think um, I'm sure if I zoom in on the books which are just be behind you, Adam, I'm pretty sure I can find some of them <laughs> being from, for instance, Seth Godin. Let me take a wild guess. That's right. Uh, and, come on. Yeah. So the person was less than I. Mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'll have to qualify what I'm about to say. So this may not apply to engineers. But generally, people don't fall in love with equipment. Or machinery yeah they yeah. want to make a human connection if i can bring to you a black box that solves all of your problems you don't care what's in the box you're just happy that it solves your problems 
And we can have a discussion as humans about what that means for you. It has nothing to do with what I'm putting on the table. It has everything to do with the outcomes that I am generating from the use of that piece of machinery. So mm. yes, people led marketing efforts, story led marketing and communications efforts always win. And if yeah. people okay. want to have a look at good stories, I, I know a podcast um, from two guys <laughs> who happen to, to be discussing the storytelling of people in this industry. So I would recommend, I don't know if you know that guy, Adam Tank, uh, and his co-host, Jim Loria, <laughs> but they guy. have a pretty cool podcast about all of that. Thank you. That being said, I've, I, I have a look on the watch and we're a bit yeah. behind schedule. I have three comments which I'd like to take and then we okay. can switch to our closing section. The first one is that one. Um, and um, to me, that comes back to the very beginning. Um, I'm pretty sure this is right. I don't have the data to support it, but I'm pretty sure this is right. That if you look at the personality profi profiling, probably engineers as sales are, are on the two opposites. So there are two ways to look at that. Whether sales engineers are always one or the other with a little bit of the other, or we really are at the intersection of a Venn diagram, which is almost not <laughs> touching itself. And at the very center, you have the sales engineers. What do you think? Mm. Um, you can bring both together. But at the moment, from my perspective, is that the technical perspective in our industry is way too strong. We have to give the sales engineer also the skills for sales and not only for the engineering. And this balance, we have a misbalance at the moment. We have here the engineering and here the sales skills. And we have to bring this at least to this level that we balance that. Then it can work. I would say some of the best salespeople I've come across in my career were former engineers that learned how to be salespeople. It's so much easier to teach engineers to be salespeople than it is the other way around. And the, the reason is, is that engineers, if they can get out of the technical headspace that they often are in, they are some of the best people to methodically work through actual problems a customer has try solutions to meet the need of those problems. They put the money and the contracts and everything else aside because they are so problem focused and they're so humble. And oftentimes they're quiet mm. and they just want to listen and learn. They make some of the best salespeople in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes also the worst ones, but <laughs> you have to do all the extremes. And I have a last comment just to share with you because I love the analogy which Alejandro is, is making, um, which you have this marketing is, is what brings you inside the restaurant. Sales is the waiter or the waitress bringing you and advising you on the right meal. And then you need to have, um, oh, the, the end is, is not showing. But what he's saying in the end is that the chef is uh, the, the, engineer. the application engineer. So yeah. And he has to design the meal. So, okay. Yeah. So let's say we are a little bit end, end of our show, but let's say we want to give, um, you know, what is the skill set really the sales engineer really needs nowadays? I'm talking not about 1980s. I'm talking about 2022 and even in future. What is the skill set? So from, from each of you, three I points. I propose that we, we pick, any of us picks one, and I'm saying one which is in temporal, which is true, today which was already true centuries ago it's go out and remember that you have two ears and one mouth so try to speak twice less than you listen and raise questions so the listening skills pretty pretty important yep adam that was going to be mine the ability <laughs> to listen so I'll, I'll give you the the uh, sort of the leading indicator of your ability to listen which is just shut up shut up learn to shut up and learn to listen to the person that you're speaking to. Yeah, yeah, pretty, 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 pretty much important. That's right. Most, most of the sales are just talking too much. And if the balance is that you are talking more than your client, there's something wrong, right? Definitely. So, uh, yeah, um, build, build up your personal brand. That makes everything so much easier. Say if you are, if you are visible to the client if he knows you if he read something about you about your content what you stands for and what you stands against that's easier every discussion will be easier and this helps the company and the companies needs to get away the um, fear they have to get rid of the fear that the people will leave the company if they go on social media they will leave anyway if they want to leave but this is not because of social media 
never ever. So build up your personal brand as sales. This will help you to you know to um, to yeah to get your goals. God, there's such a list of things which I wanted to I discuss. I mean, I have I have even, even more, but let's say if you pick, but we have to one, yeah take this. So um, we have to respect our timing. So we will be, we will be shortly over, but not that much over. But Adam, it was really a blast having oh, you on yeah. the on the show. Thank you guys. Great. Um, Thank great, you. Great. You have an open invitation if you want to come back at some point Thank you. Um, Thank you. and tell Bjorn is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam, said, was, Adam was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks for likewise. being with us. Thanks, guys. We'll be switching to our last section, which is the news. Hey, that's new. <laughs> that was a new one. I haven't seen that before. No, it was already the one which we had last. No, time. no really. Then I haven't realized. Then I have to really haven't realized the last one. All right. Um. Yeah. News. Antoine, what was in the news? Okay. So for once, the news are on my end because usually Bjorn is the one monitoring all of that. To me, the hottest news we had over the past two weeks. It's a rumor. So I take it with a pinch of salt. It might be true. It might be wrong. But the rumor says that Soar might be up for sales. So that means that we had the full drama of Veolia, Suez, and all of that. And now we have the third biggest French company, which is also one of the 20 biggest worldwide companies, Soar, which would be up for sales. There is an announced price tag to this, and the announced price tag is of 3 billion euros. Oh, so if you have 3 billion card. euros in your back pocket, which I'm pretty sure you have, Bjorn, I'm just Maybe looking for my credit card. That would be a, a, a good investment. Um, okay, who's a potential buyer? So first, the price tag of three billion limits kind of the number <laughs> of people which would really? be ready to sell that. Uh, but you know, there's this big, 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 big wave of uh, ESG investment. Yeah. So uh, there's quite a lot of money on the markets right now for the water industry in terms of investment. So that would could be a trigger for investment funds to take over SOAR, which already belongs to an investment fund nowadays. So mm -hmm. that would be a possibility, like uh, think of Ardian or all these kind of investment funds that could be willing to, to, to take a dent into that. And then there's, I would say, the bigger bet. Uh, and my bigger bet would be, you know, um, the new Suez, which is a bit stripped down from all its uh, industrial assets of Suez WTS, the former G Water, which mm -hmm. have been sold to Veolia. Like everybody knows after all these, these episodes of the drama, that new Suez could be interested in gobbling SOAR and especially Nihus, which is part of SOAR, and rebuild kind of a mini empire of what they've lost. And remember that Suez belongs now to investors, it's no longer on the market. So maybe Meridiam wants to buy something, buy a new toy to Suez and bring SOAR and Suez together. And maybe that might be a way for mm. Suez to just um, jumpstart this new venture yeah. they have with the new Suez. I mean, the uh, let's say my addition would only be, I mean, we discussed this last year that we say, hey, in 2022, we will see more bigger complex companies instead of having these small APCs. So they will grow together with all the technologies. That's what we see with Skion. That's what we see with Veolia. That's what we see with Nios and Sour right now. But if, if that really comes to the point someone has to put $3 billion on, on the table, I mean, you are right. There are not many, many companies in the room who could really afford that. Um, I'm pretty sure that we will see this year a big invest from Far East, from China. I'm not, that, I'm not saying that it is now for the Sauer Group, but soon I'm pretty sure we will see a big invest into the water market. That is my guess. Soar is a, is a special beast. It's a, it's yeah, a very French, it's a French beast. one. <laughs> um, and it, it's really a, a one or the other. If you look at the history of Soar, they have been really moving quite a lot in terms of capital structure. And I would yeah. say every second investor that was within Soar really regretted, uh, like was not very happy with Soar. And the other second investor was incredibly happy. So it's like a cycle of up and down cycles. Mm -hmm. It sounded to me like Ikuchi, which is today the investor into SOAR, is pretty happy with it. So mm -hmm. um, if you believe in, in this theory that it's whether 
black or white, then the next might be black. But that is really a totally uninformed opinion. Don't get yeah. me wrong here. So I'm, but I'm, I'm curious. I'd, I'd really like to see how we that see. develops. We would see. Good. So in the end, I think it was a pretty amazing show. Sorry that we were run a little bit over the time. But I think we could discuss this topic, sales and engineer, for the next two, three, four hours. And uh, I hopefully we made the best out of it, that everybody could take some pieces with. And yeah, the final words to Antoine. It was great to see all of you uh, interacting with us, um, exchanging in the chat. It was good to, to pick up your brains. I mean, we are just two guys in the water industry. The water industry has much more uh, people working on the topics and which are equipped with at least from on my end much better brains so i'm really happy and thanks a lot for the interaction and uh yeah i think thank you uh, everybody we might see us much sooner than you expect that's a little teaser and oh, uh ooh. talk to you soon all right goodbye everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.